Okay, I think we're going to get started. Um, hello and welcome to the role of economics in federal regulatory advocacy. Uh, this webinar is co-sponsored by the Washington Center for Equitable Growth, uh, where I serve as a senior fellow for tax and regulatory policy and the Institute for Policy Integrity at New York University School of Law. Um, presenting with me today are three policy integrity staff members, Chris Holtz, Max Sorensky, and Jason Schwartz. Um, they're all top flight experts with impressive bios, but for the sake of time, we're going to skip those and you'll just have to trust me when I say that they have a wealth of uh, very on point professional and academic experience. Um, the goal here today, which is hopefully aligned with, with why you're here, is to help you make sense of the federal regulatory process so that you can produce research that will influence regulatory policy. Um, a few quick housekeeping matters before we begin. First, uh, this presentation is being recorded and will be posted online following the event. If you want to go back and rewatch or share with any colleagues or students, um, second, the PowerPoint slides will be posted online as well, so we'll share a link uh, with all the participants. Uh, and third, we're, we are aiming to leave time at the end for, for questions, um, so please use the Q&A button on the, the Zoom um, portal uh, to type in any questions as they come to you during the presentation, and we will uh, try to get to all of them at the end. Um, okay, with that, uh, thanks everybody for coming, and I'm going to turn it over to Max. Great. Uh, thanks so much, David, and um, thanks to everyone for joining. Uh, we'll begin with a pretty high-level overview of the regulatory process uh, to set the table. So we'll start with the, the very basic three-branch structure of U.S. government. And don't worry for everyone who this may be familiar to, we'll, we'll get into more detail uh, momentarily. Uh, so there's three branches in the US government. The legislative branch, or Congress, writes our laws. Uh, those laws can sometimes be very specific. Um, but often, and particularly for areas like health and environmental regulation, those laws often lay out general principles and standards for a federal agency to implement. And those agencies are located in the executive branch under the president, and when they're authorized by these general laws, they'll write regulations that fill in the details or set particular legal standards that regulated entities must follow. And it's those executive agencies and their rulemaking process that are the focus of this presentation today. Uh, and given congressional gridlock in recent years, uh, most environmental, energy, health, and consumer rights policy, as well as uh, other areas, is now made mostly by executive agencies. The judicial branch or the federal court system reviews the regulations that agencies issue and determines whether they follow the proper law and procedure, and we'll discuss that uh, more in a moment. So you're probably familiar with many key executive agencies. This slide just provides a few non-exhaustive examples. Uh, some agencies are tasked with writing and enforcing health and environmental standards. EPA, for instance, sets federal pollution controls. OSHA sets workplace health and safety regulations. Uh, some agencies exert authority over the energy and transportation sector. So, for instance, there's DOE, which sets efficiency standards for consumer appliances. And there's NHTSA, which sets safety standards and efficiency standards for motor vehicles. And yet other agencies are tasked with pr uh, protecting consumers and regulating fin financial markets, like the ones at the bottom, CFPB, FTC, SEC, and others. We won't discuss any of these agencies in particular depth here, but these are the types of agencies that this presentation concerns at a, at a high level. So what authority do these agencies have to prescribe standards in the first place? Well, there's not one single answer. There are many different answers, and it all depends on the laws that Congress wrote and the delegations that, the, that those laws provide. So as, as an example, I'm going to discuss EPA's authority the, to issue pollution standards for power plants under a federal statute called the Clean Air Act. So the Clean Air Act is uh, fairly broad and open-ended. It authorizes EPA to set performance standards for power plants that, I quote, reflect the best system of emission reduction. Uh, so on its face, this grant gives EPA broad discretion to set appropriate emission standards uh, for each pollutant uh, because it does not dictate how stringent or loose the standards have to be. It defers to EPA to set those limits. 
But while this and other statutes are often broad, they always contain limits. So to use the same example, EPA's best system of emission reduction applies only to the power sector and other similar sources. It does not apply to the entire economy. So EPA lacks authority to set pollution standards for every home or office building, for instance. And sometimes courts will read implicit limits based on statutory context, even if they're not explicit in the statute. So in two years ago, the Supreme Court ruled that EPA's best system of emission reduction must be based on controls that allow individual sources to operate more cleanly and cannot be based on shifting power generation from dirtier to cleaner sources. So understanding an agency's authority is a legal question that may require consulting with experts beyond the economic field to fully comprehend. And you know, one shouldn't assume that the law permits the first best policy, like in this case, uh, a nationwide carbon tax. So with that, I'll pass it on to Chris to talk more about the rulemaking process. Thanks, Max. So the rulemaking process itself, that is actually proposing and developing standards is a very detailed and time intensive process that could take years from beginning to end. Uh, the first step is uh, that agencies will engage in an information gathering process. And this can vary by agency and rule, but often it includes workshops or opportunities for public comment, like requests for information or what are known as advanced notices of proposed rulemaking. Agencies could put uh, economic models or methodologies out for public comment before issuing rules uh, that apply them. So once the agency has gone through that process and gathered enough information, it will issue a proposed rule. And the pro pro proposed rule will include a draft of the regulatory text along with its economic and supplemental analyses, which I'll discuss in a moment. Um, this proposed rule will trigger a public comment period where anyone can offer public feedback uh, the comment period is relatively short, often 60 days, but it can also vary. And when an agency finalizes a rule, it has to consider and respond to all the comments that it received during the comment period. The agency can amend the rule that it proposed, uh, but the final rule is usually pretty similar to the proposed rule. And an agency may decline to finalize a rule it proposes, or it could reissue a second proposed rule with another public comment period if it decides to make major changes to the proposal, but this is fairly uncommon. So how is technical and economic analysis used in rulemaking? Um, agencies undertake a regulatory impact analysis for all rules that have, quote, economically significant effects. Those are effects uh, of greater than $100 million in any year. The attendant cost benefit analysis is typically used to justify rules. In particular, if the net, if the net benefits are positive, consistent with a Calder-Hicks criterion, then the cost benefit analysis supports the rule. To be consistent with Calder-Hicks, analysis need not include any plan for implementing transfers among parties bearing costs or enjoying benefits only an accounting of whether and by how much benefits exceed costs in the aggregate. So in general, agencies are instructed to choose the regulatory approach that maximizes net benefits, but the process for identifying which approaches to analyze is rather context specific, and agencies formally assess a limited approach of uh, a limited number of approaches in practice. This stems from the information gathering stage uh, that I mentioned earlier. So while agencies are instructed to maximize benefits, they'll be limited in doing so if that in initial choice set is also limited. Um, environmental impact statements are also very important. A, a prominent example of how rulemaking can draw from technical and economic analysis. The National Environmental Policy Act requires that agencies prepare an environmental impact statement if the action will significantly affect the human environment. And when the action has interrelated uh, environmental and economic effects, then the economic considerations uh, must be included in the discussion. Technical support documents are more specialized analyses uh, that can be economic in nature. For example, a technical support document was written by a group of experts to form the basis for the social cost of greenhouse gases. So finally, looming over agency rulemaking is the specter of judicial review. After a rule is finalized, affected parties could file a, a lawsuit and attempt to vacate a rule, and a court can strike down the regulation if it suffers from a legal flaw, for example, if the regulation is not consistent with the congressional laws that it was issued under. 
or if the rule's justification, including its econ economic and technical analyses are, quote, arbitrary and capricious, uh, that's a legal term that means the rule doesn't rationally flow from the facts. A court may also strike down a regulation if the agency did not sufficiently respond to the comments that it received during the proposal period. So the prospect of, of judicial review means that agencies must be thorough in the issue regulations. Rules must be based on a rational assessment of the science and economics, and they must meaningfully address comments that they've received. In recent years, courts have struck down numerous rules for failing to meet those standards. And from here, I'll hand it over to Jason. Thanks so much, Chris. Um, so if you're now starting to wonder, how will you know what kinds of economic research would be useful to federal agencies? Well, a new initiative launched last year aims to make exactly those kinds of connections. Several White House offices brought together the experts who work on benefit cost analysis from across uh, government agencies into a new subcommittee on the frontiers of benefit cost analysis. It's a very grand title um, for um, really a, a group of regulatory analysis nerds. Um, and I can I can call them that since I was involved in helping to stand up the committee. But um, the committee identified uh, five key areas as, as initial priorities. Um, they hope every year to be putting out a new report with some of the latest cutting edge things they want to focus on. But the five initial priorities where agencies really want help from academics and economic researchers to get more data, more methodologies, and just more estimates of benefits and costs. Uh, the areas are non-fatal health effects, ecosystem services, wildfires and extreme weather, information and transparency, and public benefits programs. Uh, and then the subcommittee also identified distribution and risk as two cross-cutting issues where more work is really needed uh, across the board. So I'd really encourage you all to, to read through the report. And, and yeah, if we could go to the next slide. Um, and you can really just go section by section and see some of the key data gaps identified by agencies. You'll be able to see, for example, that for non-fatal health effects, um, agencies want more dose response functions or at least more data on risks across a wider range of exposure levels for things like liver and endocrine disorders, um, as opposed to the, the single reference doses that, that many risk assessments tend to focus on. Uh, agencies also want guidance on whether and how cost of illness measures can be combined with private willingness to pay measures and how to account for latency between exposure and outcomes, as well as other methodological challenges. For ecosystem services, agencies want more data on subsistence and uh, cultural use rates of resources like fish and coral. Um, they want to know how benefits relate to changes in the population size for key species. Uh, there's a new White House guidance on incorporating ecosystem service values, and, and that is now going to give agencies really an incentive to start adding ecosystem services into their analysis. But the agencies still need the data and the estimates of the costs and benefits to really be able to do that. Um, on the next slide, we can continue for wildfires and extreme weathers. Agencies want help, for instance, assessing moral hazard and whether individuals take riskier actions in anticipation of um, federal, federal protection against consequences. Um, and also, as, as another example, how to break down the distribution of wildfire management costs across tribes, states, private insurers, and, and households. Um, for information and transparencies, agencies want help, um, for example, on the value of, of labels um, by looking at um, consumer preferences for disclosures around maybe organic produce and, and the rate of fraudulent labels. Um, and then for public benefit programs, agencies really want to be able to capture the costs and benefits of programs like nutritional support, housing subsidies, student aid. Um, including things like the long-term health and income effects from these kinds of programs, positive or negative externalities to, to the neighbors or family members of, of recipients, uh, the paperwork costs and, and barriers to access to these programs, and the spillover cost savings from one government program to another. But to do that, agencies need help, for example, estimating the likelihood of, of counterfactual um, situations, um, 
you know, and substitutions. Are our local governments and private institutions going to step in if the federal government um, doesn't provide that kind of program? So those are just a few of the dozens of really specific data gaps and methodological needs that the Frontiers reports identifies. Um, there's a link uh, to the report on, on an earlier slide. I encourage you to check it out. Go through these individual chapters on these five key areas. There's also an appendix detailing dozens of additional topics. And in a concluding chapter, there's an even broader call just for more replication studies, more benefit transfer studies, more elasticity estimates, more meta-analyses, and, and, and so on and so forth. Um, I, I could really talk all day about the, the report. I think it's really exciting, but I'm going to turn things over back now to David, who's going to be talking more about distribution, which, which was one of the, the cross-cutting themes of the report, really more research on incidence and of costs and benefits across the board. That's right. Yes. Thanks, Jason. Um, I will just go into the chat here, a, a link to the Frontiers report that Jason was just describing. Um, you know, as Jason mentioned, one of the cross-cutting issues that the report focuses on is distributional analysis. Um, and this is an issue that we at the Washington Center for Equitable Growth care a lot, of, a lot about um, because we really don't think that a benefit cost analysis is complete without knowing who is receiving the benefits and who is paying the cost. Um, and not just for fairness reasons, although of course that matters, but also for policy efficiency and effectiveness reasons. Um, you know, we contend that uh, the research that we and, and others, many on this call have supported over the years has helped make the case that investing in people and communities that have historically been left behind can actually grow the pie for everyone. Um, and while many of the regulations we're talking about today might not be big enough to move, you know, macroeconomic dials like GDP, the same basic logic applies, I think. Um, and, you know, for better or worse, or we would argue for worse, the rule of thumb in kind of classical economics of there being a trade-off between equity and efficiency um, is alive and well in most regulatory impact statements uh, to date. So, our organization's goal, in part, is to bring some, you know, empirical scrutiny to bear on that assumption in as many regulatory contexts as possible. Um, now, in terms of some of like the history, both Democratic and Republican administrations have previously paid lip service to the importance of distribution in benefit cost analysis over the years, but agencies just haven't really incorporated it into their work. You know, in part because previous administrations haven't stressed it. Um, in part because analysts aren't trained to do it, uh, but also because it's hard. You need good data and research to know how to disaggregate the incidence of costs and benefits in all of the different areas that Jason was mentioning, you know, across the across the federal government. So, you know, to its credit, the Biden administration is stressing distribution. They uh, dedicated a number of of pages to distributional analysis and their revision of the circular A4, which um, is the wonky name for the guidance document uh, instructing um, agencies on how to conduct regulatory impact analysis. So that document is long and it goes into detail about giving agencies direction on, on what to do uh, across a whole host of you know, economic analysis questions, but on distribution in particular, uh, they, um, they they really give more detail than they ever had before. And the hope is that agencies will uh, really throw themselves into doing that work. Um, so, you know, as you can see on, on this slide, you know, one of the more innovative things that uh, that new guidance document um, does is it gives agencies the option to weight the calculation of cost and benefits by the income elasticity of marginal utility, uh, which the government estimates uh, as uh, to be 1.4. So, you know, uh, what this means practically is that basically it's giving agencies the opportunity to um, actualize, I think, the assumption that we all uh, kind of intuitively understand that a $100 benefit delivers a different amount of welfare depending on how much money you already have. So. Bill Gates, $100 isn't very much. To a struggling low-income family, $100 can make a world of difference. And so this um, 1.4 weight basically 
uh, is going to help um, equalize and, and try, try to allow agencies to truly maximize net welfare um, without the bias of you know giving more weight to those with, with more money. So whether or not um, you know agencies to decide to take the, the option to do that weighting, um, there's going to be a lot that they can do just to just, just there's going to be a hard uh, path just to be able to distribute the costs and benefits um, as it is. Uh, so to the next slide, um, we'll talk a little bit about that. So some of the challenges, um, and I think this is where researchers can really play a huge role with providing data analysis and methods. You know, agencies will have to decide which um, subpopulations of interest they want to focus on, for example. And, and we know that the consumer financial and labor markets that these regulators have jurisdiction over can vary considerably by product and geography. So trying to credibly estimate supply and demand elasticities, um, even with large confidence intervals, and you know, being able to trace the incidence of cost changes between shareholders, workers, and consumers, and even more granularly than that, between workers by race or by income or by gender, um, that will be indispensable research for agencies who are trying to do this distributional work. Um, and, you know, that research will also be uh, highly impactful. It will be cited in the Federal Register. It will be used to build a record that can withstand judicial review, you know, to go through the entire, the gauntlet of um, steps that, that Chris and others were talking about earlier. So there's a huge opportunity here, I think, for research to help agencies meet this new demand for distributional work. Um, we at Equal Growth stand ready to help you identify those opportunities since this is something that we specialize in. Um, and the Frontiers Report, as has already been mentioned, is, is a great place to start. Um, I can also throw into the chat a blog that we did recently that um, summarizes uh, some of the, uh, some of the um, targets that were identified in that report. Um, and we're also happy just to chat directly with any researchers who want to learn more about opportunities in this area. So I'll stop there on the distributional stuff and turn it back to Chris. Thanks, David. And uh, I know this is a ton of information. So if anyone has questions uh, to hold on to, feel free to enter those into the Q&A and we'll, we'll address them at the end. Um, so the Frontiers report mentions five focal categories where further work is needed to advance cost benefit analysis. Uh, but one way in which economic research can be applied to uh, to work in any of these categories is through improving the inputs or methods that are used. Uh, for one, there's a clear need across many of the categories uh, for the use of non-market valuation. For example, a project that the EPA is looking into is the use of cellular device location data as a means for measuring visitation rates to public lands, which in turn can be used to improve estimates of recreational use values. At Policy Integrity, much of our work is devoted to taking an agency's analysis and improving it uh, by improving the input parameters, drawing from the economics literature. Um, and elast elasticity estimates are a great example of such an input. Uh, in recent comments on fuel economy standards, for example, we discussed how one agency might improve its use of the price elasticity of demand with reference to several published economic studies. This elasticity value was used to estimate changes in vehicle sales, which helped determine the costs and benefits of the rule. Another specialized application of economic research in rulemaking is the use of the rebound effect in the same fuel standards rule. So if driving increases as a result of greater fuel efficiency, a phenomenon known as rebound, then it may negate some of the rule's environmental benefits. So getting this parameter right has important implications. And in general, I think that's an interesting example of of a level of policy detail that really attests to the value of applied economic research. Um, this is mentioned in the Frontiers report as well. Methodologically, there's an increasing need for computational general equilibrium or CGE modeling. This need is growing as agencies uh, analyze interdependencies among policies that affect multiple sectors of the economy. For example, EPA is working uh, to link its CGE modeling with its electricity sector model to allow it to more carefully assess social costs and distributional impacts of power sector regulations. Finally, uh, the simple provision of new data, as Jason mentioned, or the cleaning and organization of existing data sets is something that's 
in high demand for, for policy research. And the, the Frontiers report contains a long list of specific data sets that would be of value. So I'll just quickly mention uh, this issue of uncertainty uh, because it's very important. Federal guidance provides that when facing uncertainty, agencies should give a range of estimates based on probabilistic outcomes. Uh, they should also consider conducting expert elicitation. They should incorporate risk aversion where they can and also use certainty equivalent evaluations as a basis for comparison uh, where appropriate. A difficult part of such an analysis is how to deal with extreme events, so it's with low probability but high, uh, potentially high impact, and assessing potential damages and their likelihood, in particular, understanding what the right tail of a damages probability distribution might look like, is a critical area where research is needed uh, for policymakers. So on the, uh, go ahead and go to the next slide. So one more area where economic research can be valuable to policymakers is that of retrospective or ex post analysis. Um, federal guidance has also encouraged agencies to consider retrospective analysis of rules, but in practice, this analysis has been somewhat limited. Uh, one avenue for conducting policy re relevant research is to simply revisit the ex ante analysis that was already conducted and replace the forecasts that were used with actual realized uh, economic outcomes and data. So this type of analysis allows an understanding of how regulatory standards could be modified. And we've seen a lot of this type of work in econometric analysis, for example, in papers that use quasi experiments to assess the causal impacts of environmental regulations. And there's, uh, there's a lot more that can be done uh, in this regard. Under the executive guidance that encouraged retrospective analysis, agencies were actually keeping pretty meticulous records of, of rules and what kind of ex post analysis was being performed. That effort is largely stalled, but that work serves as a very useful starting point, I think, for researchers uh, in identifying potential avenues for ex post analysis. And from there, I'll hand it back to Max. Hey, <clears throat> thanks so much, Chris. And, you know, with all that helpful context, we'll offer a few practical point, uh, pointers for economists to influence regulatory policy. So first is that if you're trying to influence regulatory policy, it's important to ask policy relevant questions. And in doing so, it's critical to keep in mind that agency authority is always constrained by statute, as I mentioned at the beginning. So relevant questions for regulatory policymakers need to be sensitive to their, their legal limits. So I'm gonna go back to the clean air example that I discussed earlier. So as I noted, the Clean Air Act authorizes the Environmental Protection Agency to set source-based pollution controls for the power sector. So that gives the agency broad flexibility to set appropriate standards, but it does not permit EPA to institute an economy-wide carbon tax or dictate the energy mix. So if you're an EPA policymaker, you're most interested in research that helps you set the appropriate source-based pollution standards. Um, so, you know, that could be a wide range of things on the costs and benefits of those standards, like as Jason mentioned uh, earlier, dose response functions for the pollution, as uh, David mentioned, you know, who bears the, those costs and benefits, who is the affected population, uh, or as Chris was saying, you know, kind of what, uh, what would be the effect on, on costs and what would be the elasticity on, on uh, of demand, you know, as far as it affects uh, potentially uh, consumption. So while research on the appropriate carbon tax um, or energy mix is certainly valuable, that's not particularly relevant to EPA. It could be very valuable in other areas. Um, if you're seeking to influence regulatory policy, we thus suggest consulting upfront with policy or potentially legal experts who are familiar with the agency's authority and can offer you guidance on what the relevant questions are in the area. And in doing so, it's critical to be open to assessing second or perhaps third or fourth best policies like source-based controls when first-based policies like a carbon tax may fall outside the agency's charge. So our next tip is to make your research uh, as applicable and accessible as, pos as possible to a wide audience. And one way to do that is to use methodologies, models, or inputs that the government already applies. 
as doing so will make it easier for the government to directly use your work. So for instance, suppose your study applies a discount rate, or if it applies a monetized value of, car of climate damages through the social cost of carbon, um, well, the government already has valuations for those inputs, and it already uses them widely across agencies. Uh, the government also develops and uses many economic models. So for instance, the annual energy outlook model uh, provides a model of the energy system, and these models typically uh, are publicly available. Uh, so using these models and inputs when, when appropriate can make it much easier for government regulators to kind of plug in your findings and put them into their analysis because they'll already be in the language and consistent with the types of data that they're already applying. Uh, a corollary to this is to consider extending the, re the reach of your research through channels aimed at a non-expert audience, such as blogs or policy reports. This could take a wide, uh, a wide variety of, of media. The point being is that if your work is able to reach not just economists, but also other policymakers like lawyers or scientists in the agency who could read your work and make sense of it, it has a higher chance of, of making a broad impact. Uh, so with that, I'll pass it over to Jason for one, uh, one more tip. Thanks, Max. And uh, yeah, before I dive into this last tip, um, since this is our final slide before getting to question and answer period, I'll just make another call for folks to go ahead and get their questions into the queue so that we're um, ready to start firing through them. Um, so our, our final tip here is um, to engage with regulators throughout the public comment processes and, and all the multiple channels that, that exist. Um, as we've already touched on, there, there are a lot of different opportunities for engaging in the regulatory process. Um, as Chris noted, um, agencies often hold um, workshops or requests for information um, well before proposing a rule. Um, agencies may also take input from uh, external scientific advisory boards, um, which themselves may have their own public comment opportunities that um, you all can can participate in. Um, you know, speaking from from experience, um, often you know those types of um, public comment opportunities. You know, agencies hear from industry during those. Agencies hear from traditional NGOs. Um, there aren't a lot of comments um, coming in to the scientific advisory boards, even from, from academics and researchers, and I know they would appreciate them. Um, agencies also um, develop uh, long-term research agendas or learning agendas, and they take comments on, on those, and that's the way that they um, set priorities for, for future research. Um, they might, along the way, develop different guidance or technical support documents or methodologies or models that they, they put out for comments. Um, all these processes offer high impact comment opportunities um, because you know, well before the proposal comes out, they really shape the future of the regulation. Um, then as, as Chris already touched on, um, you know, once the proposal does come out, agencies take comment on that and they're required to respond to those comments when they finalize the rule. Um, so this comment period, um, is is it's not it's not too late. Um, even though the the proposal is already out, it remains an excellent opportunity to offer your views on the proposal for or against, um, including on its economic or technical analyses, and and um, try to help shape both the the content of the rule um, and and also the the support for it. Um, so a, a really critical point: um, comments do not. Uh, I really want to emphasize this: they do not need to be nearly as thorough as an academic article. Um, you know, the standards um, are really quite different. Um, comments can be short, they can be informal. Um, you know, they can offer just a few suggestions on a part of the rule without trying to go through the entire uh, rule. Um, they can really just summarize or attach prior research. Um, so one example of something that can be a really helpful comment is even just a short cover letter that explains how the agency can make use of a particular study. Um, you know, it's important to keep in mind just because a paper is, is published and out there doesn't mean that the agency has necessarily seen it or understands 
it's relevance to, to what they're doing. Um, comment letters can absolutely offer uh, suggestions or criticisms to, to make you know the rule better. Um, but supportive comment letters, support for what the agency might already be proposing to do, uh, or the analysis that's already put out there, that can also be um, very, very valuable. Um, even just a short letter confirming that the agency's um, view of you know the supporting literature or the agency's methodologies that they're adopting, um, that you know that's consistent with with you know standard economic and scientific practices, um, you know, that can be um, really, really helpful. You know, keep in mind that something that might seem obvious to, to you or obvious across, you know, academia, like, oh, of course, this is the right type of model um, or, or method to be applying in this situation. That might not be obvious to, to policymakers or really importantly to judges. Um, and so, so support can be really valuable, especially because oftentimes the effective industry is going to be coming in and maybe opposing those points that, that might even seem very obvious to, to, to you. Um, proposed rules often explicitly call for comments on particular areas. You, you could even you know, search the rule for, um, you know, the agency solicits comments on blank and lots of things will come up. Um, but you're not limited to those issues. It's a good flag of what the agency might be particularly interested in. Um, so it's helpful to look at those, but you can comment on any part um, of the of the rule that's that you have you know relevant um, research on. Um, and finally, just on, on a personal note, um, you know, during my brief time in, in government um, of the previous two years, you know, I often found the views of economists to really be underrepresented in in the comment record. Um, but when economists did comment, um, their views were were very highly valued, uh, and the government can really benefit tremendously from from your voices and your research. And with that, like I, I said, that was our last slide in our presentation portion. So I'll turn it back now back to to David um, for uh, the question and answer section. Great, yeah, thanks, Jason. And just to underscore. Um, you know, what everybody said, but I think Jason at the end, there were some great tips around, you know, not feeling like you have to be narrowly constrained to your specific niche research area that, you know, literature reviews or being able to synthesize across your field, I think is one of the most valuable things that, that you can offer often. Um, okay, with that, we are going to move to the Q&A portion of the webinar. So please do um, enter any questions you have into the Q&A uh, uh, portal on, on Zoom. Um, and I guess I'll take moderator's prerogative just to throw out the first one to the panel, which, uh, you know, we've talked a lot about the potential here going forward, but looking backwards for a second, are there examples, and maybe particularly from you, Jason, given your recent government service, where research really has made an important difference in shaping a federal regulation? Yeah, um, happy to um, to to brainstorm a, a few. Um, you know, there there might be some that I I I maybe can't share because they're they're deliberative. Um, so I'll I'll maybe stick to start. Um, uh, also a little you know self interestedly, um, just naming some examples from from policy integrity's um, own work. And you know, for those listening who who aren't familiar with you know some of policy integrity's work. Um, we are a think tank based at NYU School of Law. We have economists and lawyers. Um, we do both advocacy and um, academic research, and, and we you know, put our academic work um, towards our advocacy as well. Um, so you know, just going back to a couple of the examples that, that Chris walked through even, um, you know, um, when uh, NHTSA was doing their latest vehicle efficiency standards, um, one really important parameter is um, the sales elasticity. Um, it, it's measuring how responsive, um, you know, to changes in prices folks are to buying new cars, to switching from new cars to used cars, how that affects the turnover between new and used cars and how all of that affects both um, emissions and, and safety. It's a really important parameter to get right. 
Um, and we and a lot of other folks thought that NHTSA was getting it wrong. Um, and you know, our economists put together a, a meta-analysis of the available literature, um, trying to synthesize you know, really what is a, a good estimate of, of long-term elasticity. We felt the agencies were focusing way too much on short-term elasticity. Um, some other um, uh, academics um, did the same. And um, in fact, um, so this is going back back around, of not to, NHTSA currently has a, a proposal, they're hopefully about to finalize the rule. In the previous round, between the proposal and the final, we submitted those comments, others did too. Um, and, and they changed their elasticity assumption and it really affected the entire analysis um, in, a, in a really important way to, to demonstrate the, the benefits of, of this rule. Um, another you know, example that we like to brag about, um, you know, our um, economics director, Peter Howard, um, has been working on the social cost of um, greenhouse gases for years. He's put out a num number of academic papers, um, you know, was was really um, a leading voice in advocating for um, increasing the value that the government had been using for almost a decade. And um, in, in the latest updates that EPA put out um, at the end of last year, um, one of Peter Howard's papers, um, along with other papers and other models developed by other researchers, what it was one of the three bases for the, for the damage module for this really crucial figure that's now going to get factored into really every environmental regulation and and the analysis. Um, so you know that's and that's just from from our own experience. So I'm sure you know, and I and I also, and I know that lots of other researchers have had success in in having their research directly uh, impact regulations. Absolutely, yeah, no, great, great example there. Another one that comes to mind for me a little bit more at the front end of a process is Evan Starr, another labor economist, did a lot of great work on non-compete agreements, I think really raising the profile of um, you know, those, and then the Federal Trade Commission has now initiated a rulemaking around that. So um, you can kind of do the, uh, issue discovery type work of, of highlighting issues for the government, as well as the um, maybe more granular, you know, what's the exact right parameter for a particular uh, regulation. Um, great. Well, encouraging the audience to enter in questions, we, uh, I will go now to audience Q&A. Here's a question that uh, uh, poses, does the OMB guidance provide instructions on how to incorporate background pollution into distributional analysis? or does it primarily focus on income elasticity? Um, I can quickly say that income elasticity is just one of many um, elements of distributional analysis that the, the Biden administration is interested in incorporating into analysis. So that one's maybe the easiest to quantify. And so they've done this um, you know, uh, suggested weighting just for income, but for sure uh, agencies, particularly agencies that regulate pollution would be very interested, I think, but but others should chime in from the panel in, um, you know, in, in a distributional analysis of, of maybe geographically, maybe income, race, you know, which communities are facing higher levels of pollution. Others who have worked in the environmental justice field should, should chime in. Yeah. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that. Yeah, I mean, the, 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 the new OMB guidance has, uh, has a whole long section on, on distribution and, and the weighting is, is only the last piece of that. There's uh, several sections, subsections prior to it that talk about how you need to uh, look at what populations are affected. Think about what is the baseline incidence of, you know, whatever, uh, you know, if you're looking at pollution, you know, the what's the baseline incidence of pollution in the affected communities? What's the baseline risk? of disease, thinking about what is the vulnerability that the community may be facing. So for instance, uh, some communities may um, you know, have less access to, to healthcare or may be facing risks from different pollution that could potentially affect the dose response functions uh, between communities. So you know, the, the guidance, as, as Dave said, the, the elasticity estimate, the 1.4 kind of cuts across everything whereas all of these other considerations are pretty specific, you know, depending on the factual circumstances and 
and the rulemaking. So the guidance is fairly high level when it comes to these um, these critical areas. But you know, you don't get to you don't get to to waiting until you've looked at, at the incidents really carefully. So as, as Jason and, and David mentioned earlier, the Frontiers report really gives a lot of guidance on where further research would be useful to identify these different baseline risks and vulnerabilities. Yeah, and I'll say there's also a lot of room to contribute in terms of methodologies. It, it's not very established, and please correct me if I'm wrong, um, which tools to use. And there are a lot of tools out there in maps or the APX models that, and uh, local air pollutant transport models. Uh, all of these, uh, you know, are kind of um, being developed right now. And the more they're applied, um, the more it becomes clear which ones are going to be the preferred choice. But that that's still kind of very much a work in progress. Yeah, definitely another example, I think, of um, opportunity for academia and other researchers to, uh, you know, coalesce or build some consensus around a particular approach. You know, I've noticed this in some of the work we do at Equal Growth that, you know, even, even economic statistical agencies like to get kind of a proof of concept from academic research centers, understand uh, a new parameter before they incorporate it into the official, you know, government uh, work. So I think there's always some uh, interplay and some opportunity there. Um, okay, next question is, um, uh, how am I supposed to keep track of when these comment periods arise? Okay, that's a good question. I don't know who wants to take it, but uh, it is a little bit of an intimidating uh, black box here. So how are folks supposed to keep track of which rules are coming up for comment at, at which time? Well, of, of course, everyone should just do what I do and, and read the table of contents to the Federal Register every morning with your coffee, right? Um, no, of, of course, we don't expect you all to, to do that. Um, I don't know if there are many people in the country who, who do that. Um, but so um, the Federal Register is is a useful resource to know about. Um, it, it is the government's publication of what agencies are getting up to every day. Um, they publish all sorts of um, notices of, you know, meetings and determinations along with um, proposed rules. Um, so a lot of the comment opportunities that we've talked about are published there. Um, you know, you can find it at federalregister.gov. Um, and you can um, set up alerts. So if there's a particular area that that interests you, a, a, a keyword, a topic, if you've heard about a, a rule coming up or you know, know a rule that happened and you're interested and the next time it gets revised or anything like that, you know, the, the keyword alert function on Federal Register um, is actually a, a really good um, a really good tool. Um, you know, different um, different Subject matters have different um, advocacy groups uh, around them. Um, you know, we do a lot of work in the environmental and, and energy space, so you know, um, that's the one I, I maybe know most about. But you know, a lot of the the key NGOs in the environmental space um, keep track of of these types of um, regulatory proceedings and often encourage their members um, to comment. They'll often send out a you know, can you can you sign your name to this form comment sort of a, a thing? Um, but that's a good way to just get alert to things that are going on and, and when the comment periods are. And, you know, if if you follow a couple key groups, um, you'll at least know about, you know, the biggest rulemakings going on um, and the biggest opportunities. Um, and, um, you know, that's that's a chance to um, do your own put in your own work. Um, finally, uh, I, I might just say, um, you know, this isn't something we've officially even discussed as, among policy integrity, but, um, you know, reach out to us. Um, we we often will reach out to um, academics during, you know, a, a public comment period and say, hey, you know, there's this thing going on. We think your research is relevant. You know, think about submitting something, but we don't always know who the right people are. So, you know, I, I would say to everybody on, on this call, feel free to 
to reach out to us. Let us know the areas that you're interested in, the kind of work that you've done. Um, and if it's something that we're tracking too, you know, we, we are happy to help loop you in um, to when a, a comment period comes up. Well, one thing uh, one thing I'll add to, to all the great points Jason just made is I would encourage uh, economists to kind of socialize this with each other when, when they can. So, you know, uh, as Jason said, you know, sometimes we, we reach out to academics to try to get them to, uh, to, to comment. Uh, we did this uh last year the federal government was, was uh, proposed to amend the, the discount rate that it uses when uh when assessing the present value of future benefits and costs and so we reached out to a few of the of the known experts in, in this area and some of them were familiar with what the government was doing some some of them i think we informed them for for the first time but what they all did is they all were like oh i know these five people who've also done research on this area and let me reach out to them. And then there ended up being this whole network of, of uh, researchers who, who've, uh, who've done work and scholarship on, on the discount rates who ended up getting involved in that proceeding. That's really helpful, thanks. And yeah, I should say that we at Washington Center for Equal Growth are also trying to be better about this flagging opportunities for um, researchers in our network or adjacent to our network, um, you know, opportunities for them to comment so that they know what's available. Actually, right this moment, uh, there's a notice of proposed rulemaking from the Treasury Department about data sharing between the IRS and Census Bureau. And we know that a lot of researchers use um, census data for their, their research projects and so that they might be interested in commenting in support of more data sharing across Agency. So that's a you know fairly niche example, but one that's kind of um, uh, very current and, and something that we're going to try to get the word out here in the next few weeks about. But if folks are particularly interested in that, get in touch with me. Um, okay, I think we probably have time for one last question. So I will um, read here. Uh, do agencies really set their regulations based on economic analysis, given political and other considerations? Um, you know, if not, what's the point of spending time and resources on economic analysis if it's not going to be uh, taken seriously, I guess, is the, the implication here. So um, I think that we've made clear that it, it is taken seriously. It does matter. But if others on the panel want to expand on that. Bit. Yeah, I, I could jump in. I mean, you know, as Chris mentioned earlier, I mean, federal guidance makes it clear that it's, it's important to conduct a cost benefit analysis and to listen to the results of that analysis when thinking through your regulation. Now, is the administrator of, or the secretary of, of an agency is the first thing that they're thinking about in setting the regulatory priorities to cost benefit analysis? But potentially not, but that being said, the cost benefit analysis, if the, if the agency can't make the analysis work, there's a good chance that they're not gonna pursue the regulation even if they want to. And, you know, as, as Chris said, kind of looming over all of this is the specter of judicial review. Kind of most big federal regulations get challenged these days. And agencies, when they're putting out rules, they're always asking themselves the question of how can we justify this to uh, an arbiter who's not an expert in the area, uh, who may, uh, you know, not be sympathetic to our causes, right? What are the arguments that the people who want to strike this, this rule down the most are going to make against it? And so the agencies need to have a really robust record defending the rule. And if they can't put that record together, then then that's a reason why the rule might not go forward or, or may go forward in a, in a weakened state. So, you know, sometimes the cost benefit analysis is driving the rule. Sometimes it's supporting the rule. But I think in, in pretty much all cases, if it's not there, that the rule is going to get watered down or may not happen at all. And I, I'll, I'll just add, you know, from my time in government, you know, without going into any any specific details, you know, generally I, I can say that, you know, folks in government take the analyses seriously um, for every significant rule. It goes through an interagency review and, and comment process um, where, you know, other agencies, folks in the White House, lawyers, you know, a whole sort 
of experts across the government besides just the agency putting out the rule, um, take a really close look at things. And yeah, like Max said, you know, is the cost benefit analysis, you know, the very top thing that's affecting every aspect of the rule? No, not always, but um, almost always, you know, for important rules, the analysis has talked about, people care about getting it right. It can change the content of the rule. It absolutely changes the support of the rule. Um, and, and so it, it definitely matters. Thank you for that. I think with that, we're, we're almost at the top of the hour. So we will, um, we will close now, but thanks everybody for coming. I wanna thank um, the NYU Institute for Policy Integrity uh, for co-sponsoring this webinar with the Washington Center for Equitable Growth. I think as we both have said, we're, we're very happy to continue the conversation after this webinar with any researchers who are interested in talking more about the regulatory process and how they can influence regulatory policy. It's a huge opportunity um, I think for, uh, for, for academic and other researchers. Um, and for those interested in, in more on regulatory policy, uh, we at Equal Growth are hosting a second webinar kind of in this vein. Uh, the next one is with uh, Democracy Forward, which is a, another partner organization, an expert legal advocacy group. Um, and that will be on April 29th at 2 p.m. And that's specifically on emerging trends in administrative law, basically the amount of deference agencies get uh, from the courts. And so if you're interested in kind of the legal angle, and how that's changing and how that might impact economic and social science uh, influence on the process. Um, that is a webinar you're not gonna wanna miss. I'll put the registration link in the chat. Um, and uh, I think we'll, we'll close on that. So thanks everybody for coming. Uh, really appreciate your time and attention.